All right, in the last video, we talked about how pressure works and how that unit works. Now we need to talk about how the gas laws work. The way the gas laws work is we usually relate things like pressure and volume or temperature and volume or temperature and pressure. We kind of just see how these things are related, okay? Um, most of these are pretty common sense. So if you had a balloon, okay, and it had a certain pressure and a certain volume and the temperature stayed constant and you sat on the balloon, the pressure inside should go up even though the volume is decreasing. What this means for us is that volume is in, I can't write an out, or like a proportionality sign, whatever, is inversely proportional to pressure. <laughs> That's supposed to be a proportionality symbol, I can't write it apparently. So what this means is as volume goes up, pressure goes down. As pressure goes up, volume goes down. That doesn't help us a lot. We need to solve for like specific numbers. It turns out that for any given situation, if you multiply these together, it's going to equal some sort of constant. Okay, for right now, we don't actually care what that constant is. All that really matters is that if you have some initial conditions and then you change it, the pressure times the volume will both be equal to that constant. So if you have the initial conditions equal to a constant and then you change things and it's still equal to the same constant, then the initial and the final conditions are equal to each other. Um, I don't care if you learn this, but this is called Boyle's Law. Some guy, I don't know. Okay, but the idea is that pressure and volume work like this. So as long as you, if you have one set of conditions and you change things, you have, as long as you have three of the four variables, you can solve for the unknown one. I'll do some examples eventually, but we're just gonna work through some of the laws here. Um, if we talk about temperature and volume, if you have a balloon and the pressure is constant, but you heat it up, you would expect it to expand, right? It's not gonna contract because it got hot. It's gonna, basically the particles are gonna move faster and push harder on the balloon and it's gonna expand. So it turns out that volume is directly proportional to temperature. I'll just draw it as an alpha. That's somewhere in between those is what the symbol's supposed to look like. Okay. So this means we can follow the same logic. Volume divided by temperature should be equal to some constant. And we can get this equation. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. This is known as Charles' Law. I do not care if you know these guys' names. <laughs> okay. Um, actually, honestly, it's probably got the, the, yeah, the symbol on the right. Um, let's try an example and see how this works. I'll just make up an example. I figure we shouldn't do too many of these without an example somewhere. Okay, so we have volume and temperatures. Let's use that one. Sure. Okay. So let's say a sample of nitrogen gas has a volume of 1.36 liters at 20.0 degrees Celsius. We want to know if we change the temperature, what's the new volume going to be? What is the volume at 40 degrees Celsius? Okay. So we basically have V1 and T1 and V2 and T2. We have four things. We have three of them, so we solve for the fourth one. Essentially, we have initial conditions, V1 and T1. We're solving for V2, we don't know T2. So I'm gonna show my work for the algebra just to show how it works here. Okay, so we're solving for V2, that's the one we don't know. So we need to get rid of this T2. So since it's in the bottom, we're gonna multiply by T2. And whatever we do to one side, we're gonna to have to do to both sides. So on this side, it cancels out, and we're left with V2. And on this side, we have V1 T2 over T1. So I'm going to rewrite that. V1 and T2 are on the top, divided by T1. So we have these numbers. Plug them in. V1 is 1.36. T2 is 40. And T1 is 20. Well those cancel out this degree Celsius, so we end up with liters, which makes sense, which is encouraging. We set up our equation correctly. And if you plug this in, um, 
1.36 times 40 divided by 20, and I got 2.72. Okay? Yay! That answer is wrong. Here's the problem. Okay. Um, what would happen if I said we went from 20 to negative 20? Let's say it got colder. If you plugged in 20 and then your final temperature was negative 20, you would end up with negative 1.36. You would end up with like a negative volume. And that is literally impossible and it doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So for anything involving gas laws, your temperatures must be in Kelvin because it's the only temperature scale that doesn't have negatives. Okay, converting to Kelvin is not difficult. Okay. You just add 273.15. So Kelvin equals degrees Celsius plus 273.15. Okay, so let's do each of these numbers and see what we get. Well, this would be 293.15 Kelvin. And I guess 20 more than that would be 313.15 Kelvin. So now we can substitute those numbers in and we'll probably get a much better answer. So V2, say the equation was rearranged correctly, but we plugged in the Celsius temperatures, not the Kelvin temperatures. So 1.36 times 313.15 divided by 293.15. Kelvins will still cancel out. And what you'll find is that the answer doesn't really change a whole lot. 1.36 times 313.15 divided by 293.15, and I got 1.45. Okay, so what you're finding is that it takes a huge temperature change to cause much of a volume change. This is one of the reasons like hot air balloons use giant freaking flames to like heat the entire thing. It's because you can't just heat up things a little bit and expect, expect it to expand very much. Okay. Okay. Um, for the next gas law, I'm actually just going to tell you how this works. There's not really an equation for this one. Um, this is called Avogadro's Law, same guy that we've uh, heard of before, probably misspelling his name, but whatever. I think it's Avogadro's Law. His is relating number of moles, because he's the guy who came up with that one mole equals 6.022 times 10 to the 28th, or 23rd thing. Um, Avogadro's constant. He, his is really easy. If you have a balloon, with a certain amount of particles and a certain volume and you increase the number of particles, it's probably going to take up more space. Really straightforward. But what he found was that at standard temperature and pressure, so standard temperature and pressure, which is zero degrees Celsius, which is the same thing as 273.15 Kelvin, and one atmosphere of pressure, again, chemists like that, <laughs> the, the one atmosphere is really easy. What he found was that one mole of any gas should be equal to 22.4 liters. In the lab, last week, week before, something like that, you, the gas law lab, you guys literally measured, like experimentally tried to solve for this number. Hopefully your answers came out to somewhere near 22.4, okay? So here's the problem, is we have three different gas laws so far, and each one applies to a very different situation, whether you're talking about pressure and volume, or volume and temperature, or volume and number of moles. It depends. It, it gets complicated. So what we have instead is this thing called the combined gas law, where we basically just take all of those concepts and smash them together. It actually makes life easier. But the equation is P1V1 over N1T1 equals P2V2 over N2T2. Okay. N is the number of moles. Because I should point that out since we haven't talked about it yet. 
So these are the initial conditions, pressure, volume, moles, temperature. Temperatures need to be in Kelvin. This is the final conditions, okay? Now, what I will tell you is that if you, one of these things doesn't change, it'll just cancel out. So let's say the number of moles is the constant, is, is the same throughout. You can literally just not put it in the equation. If your temperature doesn't change, you can just remove that. If the pressure is constant somehow, uh, I'm in the way. <laughs> you can literally just remove P1 and P2. Okay. So let's just try an example just to make sure that you have one in your notes. I don't even have an example made, but I'll make one up. Okay. If a 12.5 gram sample of, well, uh, let's say O2 gas, actually, let's do CO2. Sorry. Um, sorry, has a pressure of 674 millimeters of mercury at, I don't know, 25 degrees Celsius and in a volume uh, in a, I don't know, 3.45 liter container. What will the pressure of a, um, I don't know, 15.0 gram sample of CO2 have at 50 degrees Celsius in a 4.15 liter container. So in other words, we basically have initial and final conditions for everything. Sorry, my, sorry I was making this up on the fly. Okay. What I'm going to recommend for anybody doing word problems who struggle with word problems, which these all tend to be word problems because we're using this equation, is I'm going to do a little inventory of what we know and what we don't know, and I'm going to also make sure the units all cancel out. P2, V2, N2, and T2. So at first glance, we may not even have all of these things, but that's okay, we can figure it out. So the pressure one is, this is, we're gonna say everything before the parentheses is the initial set of conditions and everything afterwards is the final. It may not always work out, but for this one it does. Okay, so P1 is 674 millimeters of mercury. It doesn't specify what the units need to be, so that's totally fine. V1 is a 3.45 liter container. Okay, that's how big it is. N1, we don't have that, but we can get it. We have 12.5 grams of CO2. Using the periodic table, we add up a carbon and two oxygens, and it comes out to 44.010 grams per mole. We can get moles. Okay. I don't know what the answer is, but we'll figure it out. 12.5 divided by 44.010. That comes out to 0.284 moles of O2. T1 is 25 degrees Celsius, but we need to add 273.15 to get Kelvin. So that would be 298.15 Kelvin. P2 is what we're solving for, it says what's the final pressure. V2 is 4.15. N2, same concept, but we take 15.0 divided by 44.010 grams per mole. And we get some sort of number. And I got 0.341. Don't think I left myself enough space, but that's okay. Um, and then T2, we have 50.0 degrees and we need to add 273.15. So that would be 323.15 Kelvin. Okay, I'm running out of space, so I'm gonna do this on the beginning of the next page. So we have P1, V1 over N1, T1 equals P2, V2 over N2, T2. 
we are solving for P2. So I'm going to show all my work. We want P2. We want everything else gone. So to get rid of V2, since it's in the top, we're going to divide by V2 on both sides. Right? Okay, that will cancel that out. We need N2 gone, so we're going to multiply because it's in the bottom. We need T2 gone. It's also in the bottom, so we're going to convert it like that. And what we have is that P2, everything else is canceled out, equals all of this stuff, which is a lot. Most of these problems don't have every variable, but I wanted to see what it would look like if it did. So P2 equals P1 and V1 are on top, and N2 and T2 are on top. And in the bottom, we have N1, T1, and V2. Well, we literally just figured all those things out. So let's plug them in. So P1 is 674 millimeters of mercury. V1 was 3.45 liters. N2 is 0.341 moles. T2 is 323.15 Kelvin. N1 was 0.284. T1 is 298.15, and V2 is 4.15 liters. So, hopefully everything cancels out, and hopefully I plugged everything in correctly. But the liters will cancel out, kelvins will cancel out, moles will cancel out, and we'll be left with millimeters of mercury, which is a pressure unit, which is great, because we're solving for pressure. So, plug everything in. 674 times 3.45 times 0 0.341 times 323.15. It equals, get a huge number, but then I need to divide by all the stuff on the bottom. Divide by 0.284, it equals, divided by 298.15, it equals, divided by 4.15, it equals. And I get 729. Uh, sig figs, everything's got three for the most part, so three sig figs, 729 millimeters of mercury. Which honestly isn't that high of a pressure. <laughs> um, we said that typical atmospheric pressure, that 760 millimeters of mercury is like typical breathing atmosphere. This is lower than typical breathing atmospheric pressure. Okay, but the idea is we had initial and final conditions. This equation worked for pretty much any set of initial and final conditions. All right. Thanks.